On tonight's episode of London Lights, we're going to talk about that great London band, Thundermug. And I'm honored to have as my guest tonight, Herman Gooden. He is a renowned Londoner himself. In fact, as I read your impressive resume, Herman, I'm tempted to do a show on you right now. We'll do Thundermug later. <laughs> but I'm just kidding, uh, of course. <laughs> Let me uh, talk about your introduction, your resume for a moment. So um, you've provided me a three-page resume. Uh, it's very impressive. Herman is a print, radio, and television journalist, magazine editor, award-winning playwright for radio and stage, a published novelist, essayist, and a short story writer. Very impressive, Herman. That's right. Um, as I look at your list of journalism accomplishments, uh, I'm quite, uh, quite impressed. You've been featured in the London Free Press, uh, Catholic Insight, Christian Life in London, The London Yodeler, The Voice of London, Scene Magazine, the editor of that for four years, London Magazine. You've been a regular on CBC Radio for years. You've written numerous books and plays. You've been on television. I get exhausted reading that. <laughs> but uh, seriously, uh, it's great to have you as a guest. And uh, anytime I've seen you, even on Rogers, you're talking about uh, subjects that to most of us might seem mundane, but you find those little interesting grains there that make it a very inter interesting and uh, uh, enjoyable story. So thanks for being here. Sure uh, we're going to talk about that great London band, Thundermug. And just by way of introduction, this is their album cover, by the way, behind me, that first great album, which we'll talk about. But uh, just by way of introduction, uh, as a high schooler in London in 1971, I loved it when I could hear Canadian bands on the radio because there weren't many of them. And uh, I know Winnipeg had Guess Who and the Guess Who was a great band and I was a big fan of them, but they were from Winnipeg. As far as I was concerned, that was on the other side of the earth. <laughs> uh, so when I finally heard some music on the radio from a Londoner, I was just over the moon. And the first thing I heard was a single by a DJ called Roger Ashby, and he did a song called Speed City about London's drug problems back in the early 70s. But I thought, how cool, here's a guy from London doing a record. And then of course, the next thing that happens, Africa by Thundermug hits the radio, and this is as good as anything I've heard in the rock genre of music. And I'm thinking, this is a London band? These guys are terrific. What can you tell me about Thundermug? Did you have those same feelings when you first heard the band on the radio? And I know that you know more about them than the average person. You know about their background. So take it away. Tell us about them. I very much had those feelings, probably a little bit more protective than you, uh, just because I'd grown up with them. And I really kind of cared about those guys. Not all of them. The guy I really I knew best was Bill Durst, all the way back to public school. He was one year ahead of me. And I was actually on the scene when Bill Durst made his first ever public appearance. He and a pal, Terry Willard, uh, had these tiny little ukuleles. This would be about 1965 or so, 64. The Beatles are everything, right? The, the, we've all just been submerged in this wave out of Britain. So they get their two little ukuleles. They work up a few little Beatles tunes for this, the, the, the Friday morning auditorium. And, and there they go. And uh, also they had a bongo player in behind. So it was a really... Uh, uh, it wasn't electric, but it was absolutely thrilling to hear these guys, particularly if you were, you know, 11, 12 years old. Uh, in retrospect, you look back, and I, knew, I remember quite distinctly, one of the songs was, of course, I Saw Her Standing There. And uh, it's one thing to hear a 21-year-old Beatle sing that song. But in retrospect, you think, gosh, here's these 12-year-old boys. And the very first line of the song was, she was just 17. You know what I mean. And uh, I mean, how preposterous and how, how unbearably sweet is that? Anyway, so when I, I was kind of, you know, I didn't know, I wasn't in Bill's first circle, but he was always around, a figure we all kind of looked up to. And it was amazing how early on you knew it was going to be music for him. Right. Now, what, what school was that, Herman? It's filled public. Uh, and from there, we both eventually went on to South. But he knew as early as grade six that it, it had to be music and that he was going to bail out of school the first chance he got. 
uh, and he had a record that uh, he hadn't been born until about 10 p.m. On, on on his particular birthday, and he, so he knew if he quit that day, if they had that record, if they had that record as well, uh, they might not let him go. So he couldn't quit till the next day. But that was how sure this guy was. Um, anyway, the, 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 that first band was called the Beatle Maniacs. They didn't even have a name. They hadn't thought to give themselves a name. What a concept. Uh, but just before they were sent out, yeah, Beatle Maniacs. And when they next appeared, they were the Mimics. And they had graduated to full-bodied acoustic guitars and a single snare drum with that little cheapo cymbal attached. Cool. Hey, well, tell me about Bill Durst. Of course, Bill Durst is the lead guitar player, correct? He's the lead guitar player, the primary songwriter, in the second incarnation of Thunder Mug, which wasn't as exciting as the first for many reasons, but he was at that point the singer. He's a very competent singer, but he was the main driving force, the main creative force. Not to slight the other guys, fabulous musicians, uh, and you know, they really were a wonderful, cohesive unit, but if there was a single guiding light, it was Bill Durst. So tell, us, tell me more about Bill Durst. So uh, you're, is he a grade ahead of you or in the same grade as you, and you're kind of chums or buds or how did you interact with him? As I say, I was never quite the first circle. I had friends that were, uh, and I always had a very high regard for him because one knew even as early as the age of 11 or 12, this guy is going to take this as far as it can go. I mean, everybody at that time bought a guitar, bought a few drums just to see if maybe you happen to be blessed with some sort of genius. But, you know, we all knew, no, you know, I mean, maybe you got a gig at a, at a church sock hop night or something, but it was no big deal. But Bill was, I mean, uh, the way I described it at the time is he is pouring his life into his instrument. He, he knows he's that focused and always was. Uh, so he was like a kind of a guy you'd, you'd go to for advice sometimes about what you should be listening to. I remember once bumping into him uh, by the, just outside the variety store, and he said, so what are you listening to there, Herman? And I, I made the mistake of opening with, well, the Dave Clark Five, and he kind of drew back and went, uh, don't you think they kind of suck, actually? <laughs> it was the first time I'd ever heard that term, and then I tried desperately to find somebody with a little more credibility. I mentioned the kinks. And he went, ah, stick with that, my son, stick with that. And uh, and sure enough, on that very first album, whose front cover is behind your lovely head right there, opening cut, side two, you really got me, their cover version of the, of, of the Kinks hit. It, it was also their first single. It didn't quite work for them as well as Africa did. I was also interested to notice that when Van Halen arrived on the scene, they opened their whole album with You Really Got Me. But that was, you know, a couple years later at least, so. So I wonder, maybe you should get some credit for this. Uh, <laughs> I think that would, that, would, that would be overstating it, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, take us on the trajectory of the band. So you've seen them now playing with ukuleles, and then they move up a step, and they get some guitars, and they're amplified. When do they make this great leap to almost semi-superstardom here in London? Yeah. Uh, it's a gra it's a graduated thing for sure. By the end of public school, Bill's got the guitar. It's fully electric. He moves into high school, and he starts working in a whole series of bands. At least two of them. Uh, what were they called? One was the Soul Agents. I think the other one might have been uh, the, 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 the Testament, possibly. Anyway, these were bands. There was a lot of horn influence going on. Uh, the, you know, Bill would be doing backup for Wilson Pickett covers and stuff like that. But along the way, he connected with Eddie Pranskis, the drummer, and Jim Corbett, the bass player. And that bond, they, they stuck together for the better part of two decades. Uh, so that was, the, that was the rhythm section. And uh, it, they went three-piece, got rid of all the horns, all the extraneous stuff, and were doing a lot of their own original material. And th that band was then called the Pink Orange. This would be about 68. So it's a slightly psychedelic name. The music was definitely going that way. And they were just sitting around. There was one vocalist in town they wanted. And that was Joe DeAngelis, who played with the Village Guild, who were an excellent little band in their own right. It was all covers with them, maybe the odd original. Uh, and they did a version of the Yardbirds, the Naz are blue, that would knock your socks off. Oh, anyway, wow. the Village Guild called a day, I think it's 69 by this point, and Joe D'Angelis comes over. 
And the other thing, Joe, I like to say he was sitting on the name Thundermug. That was what Joe DeAngelis brought to the group. Uh, and Bill didn't even know what a Thundermug was, but he loved the sound of it. It sounded heavy. It sounded kind of homey. Sounded kind of funny, and then as, as he said, his mother told him what a thunder mug was, and he liked it even more. <laughs> <laughs> we'll let somebody Google that. We won't talk about that. <laughs> That's right. Uh, it's a bad pen. It's a bad pen. But was uh, was was there a buzz growing about the band before they had their first album? What was happening on the ground? There, certainly, uh, in terms of you know who know, I'm just going by my own personal experience here, growing up with this lot. But there was no band I cared about more. I mean, this was the band, A, they were doing original material. That counted for a lot in the 60s. I mean, average, you go to your average concert, you expect the people to do covers because that's what everybody wants to hear. But if a band had ambition, damn it, you got to start mining your own soul and coming up with your own stuff and putting your own mark on things, right? And uh, that's what that, th those boys were all about that from very early on. Yes, you had to do some covers, but it was mixed with some really blindingly original and vital uh, you know, material of their own. Um, so what happens, you take it as far as you can in London, it only goes so far. You've got to make the move to Toronto to try and get a little bit better connected. Joe had a brother in a band called Choker who made this much of a dent on the, the world music. Anyway, they all ended up living in the same house. So the rent was being split, rent and food is being split 12 ways. Thundermug only has to come up with a hundred dollars a week and they'll be able to, you know, continue to subsist. And there were weeks when that was more than they could manage. But we're talking about a two year period where they are dirt poor. They are living inside each other's broom closets. They're just all over each other. And Bill described it like a musical marriage, he told me. Uh, and he said it's like a real marriage in a lot of ways. It's such an exciting time. You're really, you're getting a buzz. You're drawing inspiration from these guys. Just being together is enough. And he says, and it's also like a marriage in that sometimes somebody arches an eyebrow at you the wrong way and you go into a bad mood for the rest of the day, right? Uh, <laughs> but anyway, it was a, a very exciting time, but they were making nothing. They couldn't get it together to find an agent. Um, they would literally go and park themselves outside people's doors uh, you know, for, for hours on end until they took pity on them and said, yeah, okay, you can go support for a choker or somebody, right? You can open up for them. And they'd get a few gigs, have a little bit of money, and then forget about it and go back to doing what they wanted to do most, which was make their own music. That's where the real excitement was for them. Okay. Yeah, there's a one lovely phrase that Bill gave me in an interview I did with him where he talked about those desperate times and how when you, they were really on the rack, what they would have to do is load everybody in the van and drive back to London, which they called the big fridge, which meant you could go back to London, feed up, mooch a little money, get yourself back together, and then go back into Toronto to live this very Spartan existence of uh, working up the material. Well, that's a great and a familiar story to many uh, bands, I'm sure. But yeah. we have to take a break. So uh, just hang on. We'll come back and talk about that first great album that put them on the map internationally. Uh, so we'll be back in a minute with London Lights and Herman Gug. Okay, welcome back to London Lights. We're here with Herman Gooden and we're talking about the great London band Thundermug. Okay, I think where we left it off, uh, Herman, the band was destitute. They are really hurting. But you know what, Dan? They're hurting, but it is the happiest time of their existence. And Good that point. is the key. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. So what happens is something happens like a thunder mug, a thunder strike, a lightning strike. <laughs> Everything almost, is for the band. It's almost that good. Greg Hamilton starting up Axe Records, 26 years old. So he's not much younger than Thunder Mug. So I'm going to give these boys a shot. They get a $1,000 contract to cut their first album. And wow. they, think, they think this is great. This is great. And, you know, by the, by the standards of the time, it's not that shabby. They go into the studio. I think they've got about a month. Bill Durst turns 20 when they're in the studio. That's mm. how, how young that, that puppy still is. And as he put it to me, we made mistake after mistake after mistake. 
that they were original mistakes. They were our mistakes. We didn't know how you're supposed to do this. He looks, they had, Terry Brown was their engineer on the record. This is a guy who went on to work for Rush and about a dozen other Canadian bands of pretty darn good repute. Thundermug was his first Canadian engineering gig. And the, the magic of that first album is this is a very heavy band. But quite often that can be, become kind of overbearing and grindingly tedious to listen to on record. But there are subtleties and nuances and tones going on and harmonies going on on this record that are really unusual. Um, so it's, 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 it's an absolute standout of its time. One way Bill expressed it to me was, he said, you know, it was a rough time in Canadian recording and, and you know, group management generally. Folks didn't know quite how to play the game yet. Things were just a little bit. But he talked about Edward Bear, who he said live were a really decent band. They'd go into the studio and it was just this pop tripe. It was just this happy, jolly, yet kind of stuff. Thundermug were the first heavy band to come through with their sound intact, plus all that other stuff they uniquely had. Well, you and I talked about this before. There were some thoughts that maybe this was London's answer, Canada's answer to Led Zeppelin. But as you pointed out to me, that's not quite a, a fair comparison because there was a sweetness behind Thundermug. There was a, a nice element there that wasn't just hard grinding guitars. There was that sweetness. Is that something you agree with? Absolutely. Yeah. The, the magic of that first album is the power is undeniably there. But you just kind of you just have to lift a little a little cover on it, and you can see all there is there is even a pop sensibility to, to some of the tunes, but it's not a trite pop sensibility. Right. And as I say, some of the harmonies are, and the harmonics are really sophisticated. Uh, so very, very authentic music. I mean, I was I was listening to all the bands at that point in time, and they held up to anybody anywhere in the world, as far as I was concerned. Yeah. And right there on side one, they open with Africa, and then they go into a, a really quite complex three-song suite. They're all linked together. And you know the kind of, you know, if Rush did that, I'm not, it's not a slam against Rush, it's a very different style. But when Rush came off, they were like the best well-oiled machine you ever heard. There was almost a mechanical aspect to it. And there was just something I always find so much more organic about what Thundermug does with a song at least Thundermug at their, their, their best period. So yeah. that, that, that first album is a remarkable achievement. And it's almost, it almost happened, if not by accident, then by innocence. They didn't know what they shouldn't be doing and they went for it. Yeah. And that went for, that went for the engineer too. Let's try this. Right. Well, the song Africa, of course, a uh, fantastic song. Uh, it was a huge hit. Did it get them recognition in the United States? Some, they got, they got, as Bill said, they were, they were really well positioned in terms of the re critical response they got. Performance Magazine, Billboard Magazine, Rolling Stone Magazine, which was the big one for the day, compared to, it said it sh their album shuddered with the power of the early who. This is a review you want to get from Rolling Stone yeah. Magazine. But they didn't know how to parlay it into anything. Uh, as Bill said, they were they didn't know what the next step would be. Everything kind of, but I might be getting ahead of myself. But anyway, yeah, the album was great. Africa hit most uh, markets, certainly in Canada, made the top 10, certainly the top 20, quite a few markets top 10. Some action in the States, not bloody much. All right, so how do you follow up on that huge success? You don't, at least they don't. They, they didn't know how, they, they were in over their heads. They were being fed advice by people that didn't really know them that well. By the time of the second album, which is like one year later, on the day before it's released, they know it's not right. I, I've been going through all those first three albums this, this, this week and prep for this talk. And it's uncanny how all the strengths that are there on the first, are neglected, are pitched out the window. I, I can't believe the, 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 the thinness of the, the way the sound of the instruments is captured. It's just not there. Uh, there's, there's the odd good tune. And if, and it's, of course, it's, it's something that a lot of bands know. You've got all your life to work on the first album. You've got maybe a year to work on your second album. So the first one is gonna be one, you know, plum, pack fruitcake and the second one 
oh, what can we throw in? What have I got? What's left over, right? <laughs> well, that's what always astonishes me about the Beatles, how they had that long run of almost eight years of hit album after hit album and new musical discovery after new musical discovery. It's hard to have that second album match up to what your first big album is. And so where did the Thundermug go? And where did Bill Durst go after well, this Thundermug uh, experiment? Well, the third album, and this is the one nobody likes to talk about, was called Tada. They were talked into wearing red and white striped suits top to bottom, gesturing in this kind of corny way. There's a, a couple of good tracks on the album, but nobody can get past the cover, right? Uh, and as I say, the engineering isn't a patch. And so Joe quits almost, the lead singer quits almost immediately after that album comes out. They work as a three piece for another four years, 78, they pack it in. Bill then goes and wanders in the wilderness, kind of, you know, mourning the loss of his musical marriage wondering what, what, what he's going to do, picks up work as a guitarist in a ZZ Top tribute band, pays him the best money he's ever received in his life. Uh, that's, that's, that's one thing that happens then. Uh, in the off-season, he even worked the Western Fair one year, which always struck me as poignantly tragic. Uh, anyways, it's a, a good hard slog. Then in 88, Christmas of 88, they had a reunion concert. All four members, first time back together in 14 years at Mingles. And it was an astonishing evening. Uh, played everything off the first album. A couple of really good chestnuts from the other two. A few really respectable covers. But man, it was this kind of moment of, wow, these guys really were something, weren't they? And You, you, were, know, there the, the, you were there for that performance and you actually wrote a chapter in one of your books about it. Yeah, yeah. I found it powerfully moving. I went in there, I, I compared it to my parents who grew up, you know, seeing Gone with the Wind at the movies. And then it would show up on TV and they didn't want to watch it. And I'd say, why not? That movie meant a lot to you. And they'd say, yeah, it can't be as good as we think it is anymore. We just know it. And uh, you know, I, I, I had some of those trepidations about going to that concert. And I thought, well, why am I going to this concert? And I thought, well, I did not go to school with Clark Gable. I owe this to Bill. I'm going to give this a shot. And it was a wonderful victory. Oh, that's great. Herman, unfortunately, we're running out of time. And there's so much more I know we could talk about with Bill Durst and Thundermug. But uh, let's try and wrap this up. So we have, uh, we have Bill Durst and Thundermug. They're on the cusp of superstardom. They can taste it. I'm sure they can. And they just don't make, make it happen. Can you tie all those loose ends together and help us put it all in perspective? I know when you first uh, asked me to take part in this program, you wanted me to talk about Garth Hudson, about whom I knew nothing. But there's a su successful musician in a re re university recognized band and all the rest. And I remember I said to you almost as a joke or a dare, I, I can't do Garth, but let me know when you're ready to talk about Thundermog and you got back to me. A lot, a, no small part of what I do as a writer is all about finding the stuff in London that 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 you, that most people don't know about, and and that is overlooked by so many. I look at somebody like Thundermug. Yeah, they they didn't hit the brass ring. They did one absolutely genius album. Uh, there were four really worthwhile musicians who had a, a a a good time of it. Bill is still working today. Is one of the least bitter people I know on this planet. Uh, he is. Yes, he wishes that had panned out in a bigger way, but he has worked all of his adult life as a musician playing music he loves. It's not been particularly easy. It's not been all that rewarding, but how many people at the end of the day got to say, hey, my life was devoted to music. I can't believe how exciting it's been for me. I mean, that is a victory. And, and the esteem that a local act has in the locals' hearts is that little bit extra, that little bit deeper, that little bit you identify so much more totally with them. There's a there's a, a, a kind of a, a, a coming together, a, a, an identification that happens at that level that is really special. It is, it is. And uh, Thundermug will always have a special place in our hearts for uh, people that love music in London. Uh, Bill Durst will, I understand he's had a a tough year or so, and uh, we wish him uh, best wishes at this time. 
So Herman, thanks for being a guest on London Lights. Uh, as I say, I looked at your resume, very impressive. What have you been up to these days? Uh, most of my energy is going into a blog, which I started up a couple of years ago, uh, called Hermeneutics. So that's Herman, E-U-T-I-C-S. Uh, or if you just do my name and spell it right with two O's and two D's, you'll be able to find it out there. Uh, but if you go there, you'll find out absolutely everything that I'm up to. Um, most recently, I brought out a collection of my plays. Uh, the year before that, I did a book on uh, artists Greg Kerno, Jack Chambers, and William Karelik. So I, I've, I've been a busy little beaver and continue to be one. And, uh, you know, all my life I was freelance, and now I'm retired freelance. So I've always been able to do what I want to do. And uh, in terms of writing, that, that maybe that's part of why I identify so strongly with Bill and the Thundermug story. They got to do what they wanted to do. And that's my story too. And uh, it's, been a, it's been a really fun run. Well, thanks to Herman Gooden for being a guest here on London Lights today, talking about this great band, Thundermug. Herman, take care of yourself. Keep up all the good work and we'll talk to you soon.